you have to have the gyms to support the fighters. And if the gyms can't survive, if the gyms can't become more commercialized so that they're able to survive, then there's no place for fighters. Welcome to the Science of Building Champions podcast, where your host, Don Heatrick, chats with top-level fighters and coaches, diving into their stories to discover what makes champions. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Lynn Miller, founder and director of Sumali Muay Thai Gym in Phuket, Thailand, and author of a new book, Fighting for Success. Lynn has a PhD in psychology, a postgraduate qualification in digital marketing, and considerable UK business experience. And now, with a decade of experience immersed in everything behind the scenes in the business of Muay Thai in Thailand, I know we're going to learn a lot. So thank you for taking the time out to join me on the podcast, Lynn. It's my pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. No problem. I mean, most of us visiting Thailand, we're we're fleeting visitors at best. Mm -hmm. You know, we're coming out. We never really get to understand both the beauty and the struggles of the Thai way, and it is very different, mm -hmm. isn't it? <laughs> and it I, is. <laughs> I hope, <laughs> I hope that we can, um, you can help us get the absolute best that we can out of our training visits to Thailand, and better understand the culture and, and the industry that we're dropping in and out of. Um, mm -hmm. But first, let, let's set the scene by learning a little bit more about your story. And I'd like to say to begin with that I urge everyone to, to go and check out your book because you explain it so well in there. But um, briefly, I just want to dip into that to set the scene. So your background in the UK is as a research scientist and owner of an independent mm -hmm. research consultancy company. Um, and you found yourself staying permanently in Thailand in 2009 when a, year, a one year sabbatical turned turned into something completely different. You're out here with, with mm -hmm. your daughter, Rian. Um, so mm -hmm. briefly, what motivated you to stay long term in Thailand and how did you become involved in Muay Thai? OK, so um, I think I think the first thing to say and one of the reasons why I wrote the book is that so many people ask me that question. And and it's a very long story. So what, what I will try to do is give you a very abbreviated <laughs> version. And so so if we start from 2009, when I first came here, uh, well, when I first came here for an extended period of time, I'd been many times before that. Um, I, I, I came in 2009 with my daughter who um, wanted to learn to speak Thai. And that interest was stimulated by our numerous visits over the years. And um, do, during that time, um, I became involved in the Muay Thai on two levels, two quite different levels. One was to train myself um, just for fitness purposes. And the, the other was that we had um, on a previous holiday, we met a fighter and Decalon saw Somali, who I had started to assist and I had made a promise to him that I would help him uh, go to the UK and do some uh, training of students in the UK. So um, what, when I came to Thailand, I, it was my intention to stay for one year. But um, it had always been a lifelong dream, if you like, to live and work in Thailand on an extended basis. And, and when I was doing my research work in, in the UK, I often used to look, so, oh, I wonder if there are any jobs there. I wonder if um, there's something I could do out in, out in Asia. And, uh, I, and I used to look... <sighs> The job seems, compared to uh, having your own business, working for, for a kind of major corporation, which was something that I'd done in the past, I, I didn't want to do that. It, it wasn't appealing to me. So there, there are very few opportunities other than that. So, yeah, when I came here and I um, got in, I started training and I got involved in um, the gym I was training at and uh, became very enthusiastic. Um, and, and one of the things I would say to anybody who's listening to this, who's never trained, I would absolutely encourage you to do it um, because, because it was a fantastic experience. I got really fit. Uh, I got a lot slimmer. I was very confident. It was, it was, it, it was a, a very, very um, invigorating um, and refreshing experience for me. 
And um, along the line, I started off giving that uh, gym owner some kind of bits and bobs of business advice, da 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 da. And then eventually he asked me if I would like to join in a partnership in that gym. And I honestly couldn't believe my luck. I thought, wow, this is an opportunity that has dropped from heaven. And I, and I literally used to think, oh, God, I hope he doesn't change his mind. I hope he doesn't change his mind. And so that that is how it happened and how I became more involved that in the white eye business rather than just, you know, somebody that was passing through, somebody that went. I always enjoyed white eye. I always went to watch the boxing when I came. And um, so that led to, obviously, because I invested in that business, a, a deeper involvement and interest in the sport. Yeah. And you mentioned about that sort of experience that you had from the West and kind of seeing, I see this quite often because there, there's quite contrasting approaches to things in Thailand compared to in the West in general. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it from a coaching perspective with, with sports science and that kind of side of things. Um, and then you're, you're kind of coming in with an experience as a business person and then looking at the gym as a business as well and how that's kind of functioning and how oh, there, are, there are elements there, they're kind of missing out here missing out on there's some mm -hmm. stuff really going well and there's some bits that are kind of a bit like black holes really and you're kind of looking at that and thinking not only am I, have I got an opportunity to to help them here but I could really make a difference is that how it felt yeah, absolutely and and I can honestly say uh with my hand on my heart that I entered into that business with a, a view to um helping the business grow and to um, to pass on any knowledge and experience that I had. It was a genuine desire to help that business grow. And um, with, you know, by that time, I was 54 anyway, I'd had a pretty successful career. So I wasn't actually looking for career development. I, I, I always used to say, well, this is my retirement occupation or my, <laughs> my you know, my fun project for retirement. It, it was about that uh, more than anything else. Um, and yeah, there's so much stuff that you don't see um, when you're there, even, even though I was there for a year and I trained at that gym for almost a year. There's so much stuff that you don't see about how the business is being run. And and the comments that I'm making are, are not unique to that particular business. It, it will be obviously not every Thai business, but particularly the smaller family run Thai businesses. Um, they have a very different way of doing things that, that is, is very difficult to uh, reconcile and come to terms with. So um, yeah, so that that was the idea, and and, and I, I feel confident in saying that I helped, even though I was only involved with it for a relatively short period of time. Um, I did help that gym move on in um, in a huge way. It made a huge difference to my contribution. Made a huge difference to the the future of that gym. Yeah. And and reading in the book there, I mean, it's all laid out in there for people that really want to explore the the details of what happened there. But there came a point where you felt like your involvement there had run its course. You were kind of not going to make any any more impact than you you could do, and that it was time to do something else. So, so what happened next? So yeah, and and that that really was was you suddenly. Uh, oh, it wasn't actually sudden, it was quite gradual, but you, you, you come to the point of realizing that the cultural differences are so different that um, no matter how hard either of us tried, um, it was never going to work. It was never going to gel together, which is actually a great shame because I think if it had done, Mm. We would have been enormously successful, but um, so so initially, I, I came out of that gym, and um, I had no intention. Um, I, I didn't come out with any specific intention. I, uh, I I felt that I had to come out, and um, so for for a while, um, I kind of took stock and 
thought about things and reflected. And it wasn't a particularly pleasant experience. You know, I'd taken a huge risk. I'd invested a lot, lot of money. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I will say that actually all my money was returned to me, and I make that very clear in the book too. But but mm. it took a while for that to be paid back. And so, that, so it was a period of reflection. And um, I, I, I really... In my mind, there was no thought of opening another gym. Uh, but um, <clears throat> the business partner um, felt that his position um, would be compromised if the fighter, who was, who was Decalon, if, if the fighter that I had taken into that gym remained within the gym and still had contact with me. So he felt it was necessary to say to the fighter, um, you know, if you still have contact uh, with my previous business partner, he, he told him that it wasn't feasible for him to continue to work at the gym. So, so basically there were three people then left with like, oh, what are we going to do now? Uh, there was myself, yeah. there was my daughter, Rian, because she'd been involved in that, the gym as well. And there, there was the fighter, Decalon. And um, so I thought, well, why not? And um, I, I, as I say, at, at no point prior to that has it ever been anything that um, I felt either that I could do or that I wanted to do. Um, but, but when I decided to do it, that, that was it. And, and I now look back on it. And I, I, the whole thing was extremely audacious to think that at my age, with no background and involvement in Muay Thai, uh, that I could set up and open and run a successful um, Muay Thai boxing gym. But 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 we did it, and um, we we changed and evolved along the way. Um, but we built uh, we built a strong brand and a strong reputation. And um, COVID aside, and that that was a difficult <laughs> time, but we've got through it. And um, yeah, we we I've not regretted it. Uh, it's been a very very interesting and rewarding, albeit difficult at times, experience. Yeah, and it it's I find this in really interesting as well. In that people that have achieved um, things like you have over the longer term, it's almost like where you are now. You kind of look back and you're like. If I'd have realised what was involved back at day one, would I have actually never would have done it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all these tough, tough journeys. They're they're kind of one step at a time, aren't they? Absolutely, and and because people say to me, "Oh, well, how did you do that?" And and I said, "Well, I wasn't sat at home." in the UK, doing my knitting, never having worked, and suddenly said, oh, I'm going to open a white eye gym in Thailand. It, it was an iterative and progressive story. And, and, and it's still progressing. We're still evolving, and we're still making major changes, and we're still um, developing the business, and um, we're... we're we're moving forward now with some exciting plans for the future. Um, so, yeah, it's still evolving and still developing. And um, who knows where we'll be in five or ten years' time. But I don't know. It's exciting to think about the future. Yeah. Well, it's the whole Muay Thai industry, isn't it? I mean, the pandemic has really just took the whole thing and give it a good old shake-up. Yeah. I, I mean, we were, relatively speaking, we were quite well positioned Um I mean, it wasn't great, but we were quite well positioned compared to many other gyms in that um, I've always run the business prudently. So um, the, the kind of the books were well balanced. There were some reserves um, that we could call upon that we did call upon during the first year. And um, we had already begun to diversify. And that was the huge problem that most of the Muay Thai gyms um, experienced because they've never diversified and they were solely dependent on, um, the, in some cases, solely the fighter market and in some cases, uh, primarily, you know, people coming from overseas to train. So so we were kind of well-placed. And the other, the other big factor for us is that we had registered all our staff for the social security, which made... Um, a, a, a big difference uh, because we did get some support. It wasn't a lot of support, but we got 
some support. And, you know, between that, between the reserves we had, between the support that we got from the social security system, between the platform that I developed as, as um, a resource for to publish my book chapter by chapter, between all of those things and some local business that we were able to get through the yoga and the uh, vegan cafe that we've got, we managed to get through it. And um, uh, yeah, and I and and I think so far. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen next, but we've got to yeah. it well because the other major thing that we did that's made a huge difference is that we got a hotel license for the business which right. I, I I'm trying to think as I speak I don't know of any other gym that has that has, that has accommodation on site that mm. has a hotel license uh, there may well be but I don't know of any other that has that, so, so it meant that as soon as who get open to um, uh, be able to take uh, tourists under the sandbox scheme, they could come to us, they could come straight to us. And um, so that, you know, it gave us a lot of leverage, a lot of advantage in able to, to, to kind of move the business forward. So, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and I mean, at the moment, because you mentioned about the fight, the fighting and um, mm. uh, the, the decimation of, of the sport, if you like, I mean that's still going on. Uh, there's there's mm. very very few opportunities for fighters now, and uh, there there are there are a smattering of promotions um, in Phuket mainly, and and some in Bangkok. In fairness, um, but that's not going to derive anybody a lot of income. No, it's just I mean it's difficult anyway, as I as I've illustrated in the book, and and yeah. uh, and I will reiterate here that that. My experience is of the Muay Thai business in Thailand. So, so that's uh, all, all my analysis and my thoughts and stuff in the book is about the Muay Thai business in Thailand. And I did um, in the book. There's a whole chapter on fight promotions, and I, I broke broke that down and yeah. um, illustrated how difficult it is for businesses and for fighters alike. It's it's, it's a very very difficult way of yeah. making a living. I found that fascinating because that's a side of it. We, as people coming out to train in Thailand or even fight in Thailand, we don't understand. We don't appreciate. And that was, that was a real like, okay, so this is how I'm seen when I come to a gym. I mean, this is how the gyms are having to survive. Um, I'm coming in with my rose tinted glasses as to what I want out of this experience. But of course the gym is trying to function and I'm plugging into that. And I thought it was really good that you were, you were highlighting, you classified kind of two, two setups, a traditional gym, which is how most of us see the gyms in Thailand, where it's the, yeah. the model is fight purses. This is how they survive a fight purse and mostly the gambling. And if, yeah. if you're not, if you're not traveling to a gym and contributing in that way, then that's not how you're going to be seen or treated. And then the other yeah. aspect or the other model, if you like, was the, the commercial gym, which is how things are kind of yeah. evolving a bit more. And it sounds like they're the ones that are going to survive the pandemic to, to a greater extent. And they're the ones that yeah. are customer focused. Um, yeah. And that's how most Westerns have seen, regardless of how we see ourselves when we go out there, we're not seen really as fighters. Um, we are seen more as customers and it's what is the business model and which one's going to suit me better as a visitor? Yeah. Because, because I think, and, and maybe I, I perhaps didn't, um, stress this enough in the book, but but without a solid business foundation, we don't have Muay Thai. You, you have yeah. to have um, uh, you have to have the gyms to support the fighters. And if the gyms can't survive, if the gyms can't become more commercialized so that they're able to survive, then there is no place for fighters. You know that's yeah. and and. Um, it, I mean, in some cases, uh, you'll get exceptional fighters that win exceptional um, uh, fight purses, but but in the main, that is not the case. And mm. um, so, you know, gyms are very much sponsoring fighters and, and giving a lot to them. And um, I, I think often that's not really appreciated. And uh, I know ma- many gyms that I know of no longer sponsor fighters. Um, right. 
Um, which is a shame. Yes. It's a shame. But um, it's a decision that many gyms have now made. Well, it's, it's got to be viable, hasn't it? Like you say, the, the gym yeah. has got to survive to provide that service. They've got to be able to, they've got to be sustainable. Um, and you, you yeah. can't be, uh, do you know what? We had this thing in the UK with um, with martial arts becoming businesses. They used to be, I don't know, 15 years ago Club. or so. Yeah. Little gl- clubs. We, we were renting yeah. part-time halls and stuff like that. And we shifted to people providing full-time facilities and it now it's different you know um originally originally martial arts instructors in general not just muay thai it was always a bit a bit seen i don't know it was it wasn't seen favorable if you were earning money from it It it's like "Mm, you're meant to be doing it for the love of the art and it's like yeah that is true to think that yes (laughs) it it is but it's uh, like yeah you you've got a facility and a service to provide and unless that's funded you've got nothing to offer anybody. And, and I think that's, that's the yeah. way we've got to see it as, as people training in it, that we need to be investing in to get this back. We need to make sure it's sustainable. It's not all about greedy people on the other end. They've got to be able to survive and keep things going. Yeah. And, and I think uh, actually uh, uh, on reflection, and uh, there may well be another book in the future, but on reflection, <laughs> one of the things that I didn't do in the book was to um, do a chapter on what the outgoings are. And mm. the outgoings are huge. Yeah. Um, business properly, um, the, there are a lot, lot of outgoings. Um, you know, obviously every month there's the, there's the staff uh Cost, cost of the staff, there's the cost of accountancy, there's the tax, there's the VAT, and there's you have to have various licenses, you have to produce end of your accounts, yeah, you, you have to have work permits, you have to pay social security. That it's 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 endless. You have to have yeah. a certain basic income, otherwise the, yeah. <laughs> You're not around. And getting in debt is not an option for a foreign <laughs> gym owner because you know you can't borrow money from the banks here. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's that's not an option available to you. So, so yeah, it has to be. It has to be sustainable. It has to be a workable business model, and um, and everybody needs to understand that. And I think that's why there's probably um, culture aside. There's a lot of shortcuts, isn't there? We kind of in in gyms will take the perhaps the non professional route in doing things just because it's it's an easier way in the short term. There might be a long yeah. term kind of kickback or problem from it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've seen I've seen more um, gyms come and go than I could care to mention, and often it's because they've taken shortcuts. And and the other thing, obviously, about shortcuts is that. I mean, I think as as a, as a business owner that any business owner has a responsibility to take care of the staff. It's you know, I, I mean, our trainers are the backbone of the business. People don't come to see me. You know, they love the trainers. They love the training. They are people love them. You know, they are the backbone of the business, and and they deserve to be looked after. They don't deserve to be, oh, okay, right, no income, off to go up to Eastern or, or wherever you come from, you know, I can't look after you anymore. That, that's that's not a responsible way of running a business, but, but many do. And all of the laws are there in Thailand. Unfortunately, enforcement is not. Mm. That's the problem. In fact, most of the business law is very similar to business law in the UK. Uh, You know, labor law, employment law, it's all, it's, you know, if if you wish to um, terminate the employment of a member, you have to do it in the proper way. Otherwise, you get yourself, you you know, potentially you could get yourself into problems. So, yeah, they, you know, the staff have to be protected. They're important. So as a business owner, I think, you know, you have a responsibility to the whole team and, and not yeah. just to the fighters or not just to yourself. It's, it's to the whole uh, entity of the business. Uh, and the other thing is, and this is something I feel strongly about, is the country that you're doing business in. Because I think 
I mean, the only reason any of us exist is because we're in Thailand, you know, and as a foreign business donor, this I have to give back to the country. I feel right. really strongly about this, that it's important to uh, to pay your tax, to register for VAT, to do things in in the way that you because if you don't then the country will will never develop it will always mm. be poor workers will always be taken advantage of and and people that come they're the worst uh tourists to thailand are the ones that come because they want cheap 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 and it's mm. okay for yeah do you know i saw in the paper that the average income for uh thai people during covid was 1,900 baht a month. That's about 45 pounds mm. a month. Can you imagine? Can you yeah. imagine living on that? <laughs> and that's not okay. No. <laughs> that isn't okay. So anyway, that's me on my little uh, <laughs> run. <laughs> it's a good one. And it's a good perspective for us to have when we come out there. You know, we, we come from a privileged place. Um, and we yeah. shouldn't be looking to just come and exploit. We sh we should be trying because, to help out. Yes, that is what it is. It's exploitation. You know, yeah. it, you're looking for cheap prices. Oh, I don't want to pay that. I don't want to pay that. Oh, I only want to pay him. So it, it, mm. it's it's nothing other than exploitation, and it's not fair. And um, and it also undervalues. Yes, whatever it is that you're providing, if, if you. Um, allow uh, tourists to behave in that way. You're just undervaluing, and mm. and and as a sport, then it never grows yeah. because there's no investment in it. Nobody's got any money to invest in it, so it, you know mm. it never never progresses. And and that kind of value and growth, um, especially when you're looking to kind of, I guess, bring in some some Western structure to what's going on as well to help with that growth. And you're, some of that's in, in contrast to the culture of, of, of the country, that retaining people so you can help them find the benefit of that, the, the, the staff and stuff, and keeping hold of people rather than just being transient and going around everywhere. And yeah. you're having to start again with almost like yeah. a re-education of the way we do things here that's mm -hmm. more professional, if you like. Um, that looking after people and retaining people is really important, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, we've been quite lucky um, in uh, Somali in that I uh, our journey, our, the real journey, started a long time ago when we got we got involved with the Marriott Hotel in in Phuket, and we've been quite lucky because we've recruited staff that were trained at the Marriott. So uh. so we've got uh, Thai staff that act as role models for. Um, our other staff that haven't worked in that type of environment where customer service is key. And um, we have managed to find a formula uh, that has meant that most of our trainers now have been with us. I think the longest is probably, bearing in mind we've only been open for 10 years, I think the longest one has been with us for eight years. And then we've got a couple of others that have been with us for seven, six or seven years. They've been with us for a long time. By putting in place things that you would, that they should have, <laughs> like yeah. holiday entitlement, like paternity leave, like a bonus at the end of the year and uh and it and and it's worked um mm. you know it took us this didn't happen overnight she was like no. oh why are the staff keep leaving why are we keep <laughs> having problems and and it takes a, and then you think oh wow why didn't i think of this a long time ago this is obvious why um and um so yeah we've managed to uh find a formula that's um helped us with our staff retention which, which is you know, uh, very beneficial to the business because they know uh, our customers know them. They come back and um, yeah. you know they want to train with them time and time again. And everybody knows what's expected or, yeah. or what to expect, and that's that's very beneficial, I think, for the business. Uh, do you know what? I saw a model. You just reminded me there. Um, there's a guy. I don't know if you've come across him. You might not have done. Uh, 
Eric Edmides, I think his name is. He's he's got a, a program called Wild Fit online that people do, but he's he's branching out into business education as well because he's been mm-hmm. very successful with what he does. And he has like a staff appraisal system um, where he's basically plotted on two axes. You've got like energetic contribution. So it's basically whether you're positive and supporting everybody else in, in the business or whether you're mm-hmm. a bit more negative and gossiping and that kind of stuff. And then there's also uh, kind of your your business efficiency as well, how productive you are. Yeah. And he plots those two and it creates a little quadrant with A, B, C and D and you kind of drop into one of those boxes. Um, and something myself having um, owned a gym business and all the rest of it and had business partners, I've kind of experienced this as well. So I was like, do you know what? This is really valuable because it was it was looking at you. You'd have thought who's the most problematic in your business. And you'd have thought it's the low mm. energy people and the low productivity mm. people. They're the worst ones. It's like they're not. Mm. It's the high productivity, negative energy people. And they're the yeah. almost like a cancer in your business that just yeah. pollute the whole mood in the whole yeah. place. It just and you, sabotages yeah. it. And that happens with in gym business, that often happens with fighters. Yeah. And that the fighter, uh, a fighter can can do that. Um well and, and anybody could, but it's not just the staff. It's mm-hmm can be the fighter and, and occasionally it could be a guest too especially if a guest stays for a long yeah. time but um yeah and it's as you said it really is like a cancer in the business it's yeah. awful absolutely awful yeah. yeah i mean i'm i'm really privileged in that you know i i work for myself now um i choose who i work with in terms of my clients and who i involve myself with and for for me, it's it's not the ability of anybody that's the most important. It, it's their kind of attitude, really, what their core values are. If they if they're aligned with me yeah. with trying to help and grow things, then mm-hmm. everything works out, and they they can kind of come on. They can develop the other stuff that I need them to. But if if they haven't got that, and it's completely adverse, um, it's more exploitative in their attitude. That doesn't work. In mm. that's that's the bit where I've had to cut my losses and leave that. Yeah. And and yeah. and set it up again. Leave it behind, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's very, very. <laughs> any business in any country, it's really difficult getting the balance right. Uh, but the more stability you have, the the easier it is to achieve that. I think. Yeah, you can start building something then. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. how important is it? You know, for obviously long term for anybody out there in Thailand, and and if you're running a business. How important is it to to understand the the sort of social dynamics and that hierarchy of the traditional Thai gyms? Um, you know, as it's a fighter crucial. coming in, yeah, yeah. And can, can you explain more about that? I mean, you go into it in depth in the book, which I think is great. But can you can you give us a brief kind of summary of that? How that looks? So, yeah, I mean, uh, Thai society is very much a hierarchical society, and. Um, there are several factors that determine where you are in the hierarchy. And um, one of them is uh, age. In fact, that, that probably, I, I would say, is probably the overriding uh, factor, which um, serves me very well, because I can tell mm-hmm. you now, I have made some absolute boo-boos culturally and <laughs> done some, said and done some really unacceptable things but I get away with it because I'm older if I'd be younger I would have had a much tougher time and um so so yeah and um using the example of age you you do not uh you do not challenge or question a person who is older than you um out of respect for their age and for their life experience so that's tricky um, in, in a gym environment. But for, with trainers, for example, and I do give an example in the gym where that kind of went wrong because in, in our culture, we reward people for uh, job performance, uh, contribution to the business or, or whatever. Uh, in, in a Thai business, it, people are usually the older people are the ones that, that make, you know, they're the decision makers, they're the ones in charge. And, um, but, but the other thing that's incredibly important that fighters have to understand is in a, a learning situation, uh, that 
this um, social hierarchy um, predominates very much in the education system too. So a pupil does not question their teacher. And um, that, that's, in the, that's where a lot of fighters um, get into problems with, with trainers because they start challenging them and questioning them and being disrespectful to them. And then once they've done that, they will never get the best out of them. They, mm-hmm. they will, if they start, um, and then, you know, I've seen fighters being very abusive as well. And, and, and after that, that the, the relationship is broken down. Whatever happens on the surface, underneath mm-hmm. the relationship is broken down. And that's really important for any fighter. And, and really, if, if they find that in a gym, they um, are not getting along with the trainer or they, they feel that they are better equipped to, uh, that they have more knowledge and more skill than somebody who's had like 300 fights and have been training since they were like three years old, if they feel that after two years they are much more experienced and much more equipped to um, decide what is best for them, then they should move on. They should, because it's not going to work. If they stay within the gym environment, it will never work. They have to move on and find a trainer that they can work with, that they do feel is passing on to them the knowledge that they have. So th- th- these these are very important things to understand, and and Thai people are very proud, and they and people involved in you know Thai people, they're not a lot of the trainers we have. It's it's not just them; it's their whole family. You know, they, it's it's their life. It's not something they do for a few years in their teens or whatever. It's their whole life, and they're very proud of that, and they're very knowledgeable, and they do not expect to be challenged um, by, by students. So yeah. it's really, that's really important to get the best out of your training. Yeah, that's a fundamental thing that you have to understand. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it from the, the performance training side of the equation there as well, but you've obviously experienced this from the business side as well. Did you kind of find that with, with you coming into the business as such that, you're kind of offering up perhaps some challenging alternative ways of working that aren't well received because yeah. because of this as well. Yeah, very much so. But in the business I went into, what I just described is exactly what happened. The relationship yeah. broke down. The mm. wall came up. The relationship broke down, and there was yeah. no way that I was going to be let in. Uh, again, but in um, Somali, it's slightly different because um, I am not going, it, it's our business. Uh, yeah. I am the head of that business and people understand that. And I, I ultimately have the final say. So, you know, but so it's a, it's a completely different yeah. uh, arrangement and setup. But, but that is exactly what happened in the first gym. It, yes, that the, the relationship broke down, and and sometimes it could take years to mend that. Sometimes it mm. will never be mended. Why well, I didn't have the time to to work at that and wait for that, so that was why yeah. I, um, <laughs> I left the gym. <laughs> <laughs> and and I see it from the other side as well, of course, because you know um, my experience is is in performance training. And I can see there's lots of really good stuff happening in Thailand in terms of obviously how they're producing fighters, but there are other areas that aren't being tapped at all in, in terms of proper use of athletic strength and conditioning and that kind of stuff. But it, again, yeah. because of the culture, because, um, well, as you say in the book, that the majority of fighters, you know, they come from poor backgrounds. They have mm-hmm. generally little or no formal education. Um, mm-hmm. And it's... Then they're historically not used to making decisions either because they've been in that sort of regimented style of yeah. of of life, um, mm-hmm. being being a fighter in a camp and and not challenging what's being offered to them, just doing it. They yeah. then become yeah. trainers and they just kind of mimic what they've always been exposed to. So there's, Absolutely, yeah. There's there's As little. We all do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, there, <laughs> but then when it comes to sort of taking on board something that's been found to be 
a successful way of doing it and perhaps a bit better to the way we've been doing it, then changing things makes that really slow progress in that kind of culture, doesn't it? So I think that's that's fascinating to kind of understand why it would be slow to progress in Thailand, even if there are some elements that could and should be changed um, mm. and, and why you don't see it rolled out wholesale in Thailand because of because mm. the setup is different. Mm -hmm. I have been um, thinking about this because I knew or I suspected that it would be an area that you would um, uh, touch on mm. about uh, uh, what, what makes uh, a successful fighter. Mm. And um, I, I, I'm probably going to give the answer that um, you neither expect nor nor want, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you look at any skill, any skill, um, like playing the piano, like writing a book, like a great work of art or whatever, Most people can achieve a moderate level of performance or excellent, moderate level of excellence if uh, they practice, right? And, you know, and, and the earlier you start that practice, then the more likely you are to achieve a certain level of, uh, of, of, of performance or excellence, however you describe it, right? I mean, mm. people say to me, Lynn, Lynn, how did you write that book? I could never write a book. And I said, well, actually, it was really easy. And they said, well, why? And that's because I've, I've been writing all my life. But that's all I did in my career was I wrote, well, it wasn't all I did, but, but the culmination yes. of what I did was to write research reports. And I know it was a different kind of report. I was writing um, from, from a very early age. And um, any great um, musician will have started when they're, when they're very young. And so, of course, they're, they're the ties uh, have, regardless of what methods they use, they have a significant advantage over most Western fighters. But what makes a real champion is something in Thai that they call Ponsuan, which is that they're gifted. And, and it's the same in any discipline. That, and I'll take Sanchai as an example because he's probably the fighter that I know best. The, mm. the skills that make him um, a truly um, amazing champion are gifts that you couldn't teach. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly it's it's speed of response. And 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 it's quick thinking as well. It's about uh, seeing things quickly, seeing what's coming next, responding and then being able to respond to that really quickly. You can improve that with practice, but to be a true master, you you are gifted with that, and yeah. so so anybody can play an instrument to a certain level. Anybody can write a book to a certain level, uh, which I would put my book in that category. But to to be a genius is mm. is something else, and and uh, my view is that um, that's something that can't be taught. It's fascinating that you say that. It's it's something I've been exploring a lot as well. Um, and that that initial talent, what I, what I find really interesting is that not everyone with the talent has the staying power to really exploit it to get the available the, the reward yeah. from it. So it's that yeah. that kind of grittiness to it as well. Yes, and that, and it yeah. seems seems to be the talented people. Um, it talent's one thing. But then it's also having, uh, or Carol Dweck, the fixed mindset or growth mindset. So if mm. you've got if you've got talent, you're actually more likely to have a fixed mindset in that mm -hmm. you've either got it or you haven't, and mm. that if you've got talent, you shouldn't have to work hard at it. And then when it mm. becomes hard work, it can make you <laughs> more fragile in terms of your ability to continue to develop the the skill for a long enough time to really exploit mm. what you've got. Um, mm. When you've got someone who's talented, who's also got a growth mindset, which yeah. obviously Sanchai has, he's been in yeah. it so long, 
he's got the talent, yeah. but he also didn't give up when it got hard because yeah. if the fixed mindset tends to be, well, if I'm having to work hard at it, I haven't got talent anymore. And I identify yeah. with being talented. If yeah. it's hard, I'm not talented. Who am I? Yeah. Uh, and they stop, yeah. they quit, yeah. they move on to something else and try and shine yeah. in that instead. But uh, yeah, someone like Sanchai is obviously stuck at it for a long time as well as being yeah. talented. And that's key. And I think another factor, um, and it's certainly the case in um, Thailand, is um, charisma. The fighters that have charisma, that yeah. can entertain the crowds, put on a good show. I mean, obviously, Sanchez got all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and and again, uh, charisma is very important in any walk of life. So, so um, I think. Uh, well, I don't think I know. I said in the book that um, a lot of the um, uh, ingredients to being good at Muay Thai are actually the ingredients to being good in life generally. It's, it's no different. It's just a different specialism. So, yeah, those are my yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And well, <laughs> fascinating because of your background in psychology as well. You know, you've got a, a, a kind of perspective on things that perhaps most people are kind of overlooking. But it is mm. everything's this kind of um, repeating patterns everywhere, isn't it? And it's yeah. how you behave in one thing tends to be how you behave in, in other ways as well. And you can kind of yeah. that, that's why I think a lot of people get a lot out of Muay Thai training, because it it pushes you into the uncomfortable bits and you see how mm. you react to that. And actually, yeah. that's probably how you react to other struggles in life as well. Yeah. And you can start to kind yeah. of expose that and uh, and work on it. Talking about sort of struggles. Um, I'd the book goes into a lot of details. It maps out everything that you've kind of um, you've experienced and and what you've kind of gained from it. But if you if you had to pick kind of what your biggest challenges were with your in your time in Thailand and and what you've learned from them, what would you what would you go to on that personally? I think, um, and and this continues to be uh, a challenge is um, communication. And mm. although I have come on in leaps and bounds uh, with my um, uh, skill in Thai language, um, it's still not good enough. It's still not good enough to really communicate. I can, I can communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. I can have a chat with somebody, you know, where'd you come from? How many children have you got? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are you going to have for dinner? Da, da, da. But to really express my thoughts, what I'm really thinking and, uh, you know, with the staff to try, okay, yes, I want you to do A, B, and C, but I can't really express why I want them to do that. And yeah, um, yeah. so I'm, I work on this all the time. Uh, I, I kind of started to learn speak Thai and then I um, gave it a rest for several years because my daughter Rian spoke Thai yeah. so well and every time I open my mouth she said oh mum shut up that's wrong that's wrong so that now because um, Rian's back in the UK now so I oh. was preparing myself for that and um, started to do a lot more um, studying of Thai language and um, the more command you have oh it's a, it's a beautiful thing because you get so much more out yeah. of being in the country and um you know you just learn so much more about about the people about the way they think and um uh, you can do a lot more stuff as well because you can you can go off anywhere and you know that you know if you have a problem that you can express and and yeah. you can find out you can ask people well well what's this about what's you know can you explain this to me and so yeah it's um it's I would recommend that to any. I hope even run businesses that cannot speak Thai. I, it, it beggars belief as far as I'm concerned. Because if you can't, you never know what's going on. You yeah. never fully understand what's going on. And um, I mean, my comprehension is a lot better than my spoken. So when people are talking around me, I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But the yeah. being able to express back again, it's that's the relationship, isn't it? And that's where you get a lot more out of it. So yeah, understanding is one thing, but then uh, being being able to establish the relationship by communicating back is is, yes. is the other part of the puzzle, it's isn't it? One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a huge, huge challenge for me personally. Yeah, um, yeah, because I'm obviously not gifted in languages. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you, you had the I your daughter Rian was gifted and she was yeah. jumping in, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I mean that sort of honesty about where you're you're where you're gifted, where you're not, and which areas you need mm. to work on. And um, can I get someone in, in to to help me out with this or not? Um, I'd love to have your your thoughts really on on where where people coming out to Thailand to train. Um, mm-hmm. I feel that you know that there's different gyms, there's different regions in Thailand that would suit different people depending on where mm-hmm. they are in their Muay Thai development. Um, mm-hmm. And actually being honest about where you are in in that development probably affects where you'd be best to go to to train to get the most out of out of your training experience do you do you Mm -hmm. feel that's right that there's there's kind of um so for example most most people coming out to thailand they want to train they want to have a fight at some sort of level that's appropriate no i I correct you on that Uh, that, that, i wouldn't say that that's the case at all i would say that 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 the minority of people coming out to thailand want to train and have a fight and right. I would say that minority is probably uh, as low as 10%, if that. So ah, the majority do not come to Thailand uh, to fight. They come to train. Right. So, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. So they're so very, I, very much the minority market. They, um, the fighters. The minority segment. Yeah, the fighters. Yeah. Segment, yeah. See, th- this is where I'm blinkered because that's my attitude. That's the way I see it. I'm flavoring yeah. it. I've always wanted and, to compete, and, and so I've see, got that. Yeah, and, and some gyms that you'll uh, go to, you, you will find, but they will usually be very small Thai gyms. That In those gyms, maybe the majority want to fight, but maybe they only have five foreigners a year there. So, mm-hmm. you know, you bear in mind that, you know, some of the gyms in um, Phuket, not not so much at the moment because of, we're still um, uh, very limited with the tourist numbers that we have. But, um, you know, you think of Tiger Muay Thai, they have hundreds through a day. They're not definitely not all coming. And yeah. I, honestly, I mean, a lot of people now, it's a little bit like a tourist attraction. We, we get gyms, people guests at Somali that say, oh, yeah, we're going down to Tiger for half a day just to say that we've been there. You know? It's like a tourist yeah. attraction. It's like the big Buddha. Yeah, go to Tiger Muay Thai. Yeah, get your social yeah. media clip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those that are wanting to compete, um, the the different areas have kind of different levels of competition as well, don't they? Is there, is there kind of, I mean, like if you're, if you're fighting in Bangkok, for example, you're kind of going to get a lot lot more experienced fighters um whereas yes. perhaps out in the islands a bit more or, or other regions you're going to find more appropriate opponents if you do choose to fight is that true yeah yeah i mean really um uh novice fighters and inexperienced fighters they're they're not going to get fights in bangkok they mm. they need to be in places like Samui or phuket um or chiang mai maybe um, but yeah, they they are not going to find opportunities. Actually, I mean, at the moment, inexperienced and novice fighters are not really going to find opportunities anywhere. Yeah, it's very very limited. But um, yeah, in general, if you you have to be pretty experienced to find fights in Bangkok. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, gonna, yeah, you... yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, you're going to be chucked in the in the pool with a, a lot of very experienced people's people there. Um, the, the other thing I guess is the, the, the different business models. So, you know, if you're fighting and you're at a traditional gym, if that's where you've chosen to go, then unless you're kind of going to earn a fight purse and, and there's a betting opportunity for you, you're not really going to get that much interest in you, are you? It's very difficult for fighters. I, um, and, and I talk about this, uh, you know, a, a lot in the book, it's a, and, and this, um, I think, causes a lot of um, problems and tensions um, because it's just, it, it's very, very difficult to earn an income that, that is livable. And um, in, um, in Lumpini, for example, I, I mean, it, I'm not sure if it's changed now. We haven't had a fight of it for a couple of years, but well, maybe slightly longer because COVID's been for two years, but they get 10,000 baht, you know, 200 pounds. Um, mm. And, you know, invariably, most gyms will take a significant proportion of that. 
So, um, yeah, I think um, to, to, to think that you can come out to Thailand and live here long term without any reserves or resources is, is just asking for trouble, I think. Uh, yeah, it, 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 or not necessarily trouble is probably the wrong word. Asking for difficulties. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it really served people well to be honest about wh- where their ability levels are, and what yeah. what uh, kind of gym, which area is going to suit them the best, and move them on in their very limited window. Really, they're going to be spending Thailand, and and to choose yeah. wisely where you go to, you get the most out of that experience, and you get the attention that you actually want. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and I think also, you know, uh, really, fighters, um, there will be a few of exceptional talent who will benefit from staying in Thailand for long periods of time. The vast majority will not benefit from staying in Thailand a long period of time. And um, I, if asked my advice, um, I always say to people, come for a year, experience it, learn a lot, go home, because that's when you're going to get your better fight opportunities, more equally match fight opportunities. Don't don't stretch it up, because it, in the vast majority of cases, it leads to nowhere. Yeah. You know, there are exceptions, but in the vast majority of cases, it leads to nowhere. So come out, learn a lot. And and then go home, and then you're in a better position to take better, more evenly matched uh, fights, you know, in your home country. And and would that be like your one piece of advice to people that would be wanting to come and travel out to Thailand to to make the most out of their time there? Would that be the one piece of advice, or would it be something else? Well, at the moment, my piece of advice would be: um, if, if you want to fight, don't come to Thailand at the moment. That would be my current piece of advice. Yeah. And um, then, uh, yes, I, I would. I have seen so many fighters here uh, who have they stay too long, and 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 it's not resulted in anything. Um, they would have been far better off, and they would have progressed more. If, if they'd gone back to their home country. So, yes, that would be my advice. Uh, again, you know, there will be exceptions and there will, will be exceptional fighters, but but most are not. And most cannot compete with the ties. You know, still yes. now, the vast majority, with a good tie, they cannot compete yes. with them. And once once things have stabilised again, I mean, we don't really know what things are going to look like once we come out the other side, but would that advice change if everything was kind of back up and running as, as it should be? No. My advice, I, to progress your career as a fighter, my advice would be not to stay in Thailand for too long yes. unless you are exceptional. Yeah. Love it. I love the honesty, Leon. I really, really appreciate that. And I, th- I think that everybody needs to reflect on that. It's mm. you, you need to, you need to be honest with yourself, with the with situation yourself. that we've got. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's, that's the way you're going to make the best progress, not living up to what you think you should be doing or, or what the posts on social media would look like. It's like actually yeah. what's going to grow you the most. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, I don't know of uh, many, and I've seen uh, quite a few um, fighters that have got themselves into enormous difficulties through poverty, mainly, uh, and living in. I, I've watched fighters physically go downhill and just by looking at their teeth I can see that they're not getting uh, the right diet and uh, they're not getting the right nutrition and and they are physically deteriorating because of poverty so to to, to stay here on a long term basis you you need help from elsewhere you cannot you cannot live on a fight purse on fight purses alone yeah, you mentioned nutrition there, um, and of mm-hmm. course that's a big part of you being sustainable 
while you're out there in Thailand, what just recovering from all the training and everything that you're doing. And yeah, it can be something that's very much done on the cheap and something you can get away with for a short term or a short time, yeah. but it, it starts to undermine everything that you're doing. And I know yeah. at uh, Somali there, you've got the restaurant, so you're kind of able to make sure people are getting that right as well. But I'm guessing that's that's a service you provided because you've probably seen it's not been done well by a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, they, I, I, I am not exaggerating when I say that I have seen fighters that have been um, in Thailand for long periods of time and I can see the physical deterioration. And of course, what then happens is they, they get injured all the time because their yeah. body just can't repair and sustain uh, the pressure that's been put upon it. So we've always had, and um, you know, in the past tried to assist fighters with their nutrition. And we've done a lot of work on, on that side of the business. And in fact, um, it, it is an area of the business that we plan to grow in the next few years. So um, we're, we're working on it now. And, you know, as I said at the beginning of the interview, we're, we're always um, developing, we're always uh, evolving. And um, that, that will be one area that um, we plan to do a lot more work on in the coming year or coming year or two, whatever. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, and, and- it's very important. I can't emphasize it enough, <laughs> and and it's it's very uh, you know it's it, poverty is a terrible thing wherever yeah. it lies. Poverty is a terrible thing. So yeah, and and on the nutrition side, there, I mean, mm-hmm. you've had your daughter in helping out with translation and supporting on that side of it, and you've got another talent in the family, haven't you? In Sam, who yeah. whose passion is nutrition, so it's like your position to kind of really have people yeah. that are into this stuff really helping you yeah and um sam you know it, it, i mean sam is in hong kong at the moment and so he's working in hong kong but um initially when we set the nutrition side of the business up sam was uh he, he was um on, on a kind of gap year from university and he came and he helped out and he worked with Rian uh, to set um, some of the basic principles up and some of the uh, the menus and things that we have. And I've since worked with a Michelin star trained chef, Jamie Rafferty from the island, who's um, he's developed our vegan menu because of course we have the yoga component of the business as well and a lot of our um, yoga guests are vegan so we have a a, a Michelin star designed uh, Michelin star trained chef design our vegan menu for us as well so yeah it's something that we've always um, regarded as important and that we've placed quite a bit of emphasis on that. And in that respect, we are quite different from uh, any other gym that I know of. Yeah. And I can't say for sure a hundred percent in Thailand. I can't say for sure a hundred percent, but um, yeah. It's something, something I've noticed as well when I've been out to Thailand, there's religious beliefs as well as being a vegan. And, and I've certainly seen problems with like Muslims who don't eat pork kind of having vegetarian meals, but being prepared by people that uh, perhaps like cooking even vegetable meals in the pork fat that other stuff's been cooked in and, and things mm. like that. And that's, and that's really messed up the, the nutrition for that fighter. Um, and, and their yeah. recovery's really suffered because they've just been struggling to, to get what they needed. So it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's kind of nice to hear that that professional approach is being rolled out to, to the nutrition side as well of, of what you're yeah. up to and, Hopefully, hopefully that will be something that becomes more more readily available as well out in Thailand. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can hope. It, it, it's a bit of that due diligence before you go out. If you know you've got certain requirements or expect certain things, that you've you've got to position yourself where you're going to stand a chance of being able to fulfil that or not. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I mean, I think one of the um, most important elements of that is is to be prepared and um and being financially prepared because obviously you know if if you want to support yourself with the right nutrition you have to be able to fund that as well and yeah you know fighters if they get injured then they may 
go for several months without being able to fight. And during that time, you, you know, you still have to have the right food, the right fuel. Otherwise, you, you're never going to get the best out of yourself. Yeah, absolutely true. Seen that fall <laughs> flat a lot of times. Yeah. Is, yeah. is there anything else, Lynn, that you, just before we wind up here, anything else subject wise that you'd, you'd have liked to have mentioned or cropped up and I kind of steered you away from that you thought, oh, that'd have been good to mention? No, I, I just think that I, I would like to reiterate about um, the, the importance of the business of Muay Thai. Uh, that, that, um, that really is the fundamental building block because unless that's in place, then uh, there is no Muay Thai. So it's something that um, people, ah, it's a very ignored aspect of the business. So um, I hope to, through podcasts like this, through my book, through other things that I write, I hope to um, draw people's attention to what is actually involved and um, you know what, what responsible gym owners have to do to um take care of the business brilliant really appreciate it and you know thank you for for sharing some of that experience from a, a decade up to your neck in, in it over there in, in Muay Thai in in all of this 12 years now actually oh, is it 12 12 yeah since uh, yeah yeah you, you, get, you get to learn a lot in that time yeah and, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wish you all the best with with Sumali Jim and the book and everything that you've you've got going on there, um, and and hopefully for like you say the the business of Muay Thai out there in Thailand, so it is still around for us all to enjoy. Absolutely, yeah. Fingers crossed, and thank you very much for um, uh, you know stimulating questions that stimulated the discussion, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank you very much. <laughs> You can follow Sumali Muay Thai Gym both on Instagram at Sumali Phuket and Facebook at Sumali Boxing Gym. And you can pick up a copy of Lynn's book, Fighting for Success, from Amazon, both in print and audio format. I highly recommend it to anyone visiting Thailand to train so you can understand the Muay Thai scene and get the best out of your interaction with your trainers. And of course, check out the gym website, sumaliboxinggym.com. And as usual, you'll find links to all of these with this episode. Thanks for listening. If you found this valuable, please like, subscribe and share with someone else it could help too. Please give the podcast a review or comment below. We'd love to hear from you. As always, you can visit heatrick.com for more Muay Thai performance podcasts, videos, articles and guides. Catch you next time.